Welcome back. What we're going to spend a quite a bit of time on is the sales approach to teaching because it's effective. It uses modern day marketing and consultative sales techniques to influence our audience, which is critical. Now, the first thing you're going to see here, you know, the first thing we're going to talk about is we call it the sales approach or the persuasion approach to teaching financial literacy. Before we get too deep into the sales approach of teaching personal finance, it's important for many of you listening to drop those preconceived notions you have of salespeople. Many of you, as soon as I said sales approach, your defenses went up. You thought of that pushy car salesman that's trying to put people into products they don't need. That's exactly the opposite of what we're trying to do here. We want you to take a consultative sales approach like those high-end salespeople do. When they take the time to understand the needs of who they're serving, they get engaged in this process and see if what they're offering fits their needs. They ask good questions. They learn about what the needs of the participant is and where they can really help them in finding what they're looking for. Then they educate them on the potential solutions. And if those solutions match their goals, then they encourage them to take action. That action piece is very critical and often missing in education. Moving them from understanding to engagement to education and then getting them to take action is a positive, positive force that will help you create momentum and make a difference in the lives of those you serve. In a moment, we're going to be breaking down how the sales approach works. But one of the things I noticed from my former job when I was before coming out of college, the educators I worked with, the traditional educators, they made great salespeople because they had that passion, they had that skill set to educate others. And that desire to educate people, that is a hallmark quality of a salespeople. So, Educators make great salespeople, and salespeople make great educators. A lot of what we're doing when we're teaching personal finance should be spent on moving people to take action. If you just enter the classroom with the goal to educate people in mind, that's great. But financial literacy is a different subject. Again, we want to help them get that momentum that helps them work towards their goals because. Education is great, but if they don't take action on that, how have we truly benefited their life? So if we look at the sales approach to big picture again, it's basically uncovering the needs, understanding the client's goals, then it comes into building that relationship, building that kind of rapport with that client or prospect. Then we propose solutions, and then the last and final stage is moving them to take action. We're going to be breaking this down to the sales approach section, but it's important to have this overview. And again, the lessons we're teaching now, make sure you take out your pen, take out, make sure you take out your notes, and take close notes on this section. This action taking is a critical element that's completely different than what traditional educators typically do. So pay close attention to this section. We're going to break these down by each phase. The first step of the sales approach is preparation. This is an essential phase that lays the groundwork for all of the other steps in the educational sales process. The preparation phase involves understanding your audience and ensuring you have the skills, confidence, and knowledge to effectively lead a class. What do we need to begin? First, you need to believe in what you're selling or presenting. If you don't believe in what you're selling or presenting, don't do it. Bottom line, just don't do it. You want to always be true to yourself. Share things that you think that are real, that you honestly know will improve somebody's life. That's why in the first class that we spent a lot of time on the problems people face on how they can avoid that in different things. I hope that helped you develop that belief. I know, just talking to you guys already on the phone, you already have the belief that that's why you're taking the program. You are passionate about wanting to help others pick up the personal finance skills that can transform their lives. If they just pick up one lesson that you teach, it can mean a huge difference in their life. By you listening to me now, you obviously believe that teaching this subject matter can make a lasting difference in the lives you reach. Through the training, we hope to reinforce your belief and further inspire your passion. 
I want you to understand that too. When you leave a class, reflect on that. Feel good. Bask in the glory of knowing that you've helped people there just for a second. Might sound a little overdramatic, but give yourself a few minutes to reflect on how you may have helped and let that inspire your motivation, the passion, and the energy to continue to do it. Make that extra call, send that extra email off, and spend that extra time practicing your presentation. Confidence. It's built through preparation. I talked about this initially, and this is your action step. Get in your kitchen. Say it out loud. It's vital that you practice out loud and not just by reading the presentation for several reasons. First, you need to estimate the time of your presentation and your reading for speaking pace is significantly different. Knowledge of the topics presented obviously is really important. If you're not confident on a subject, and I've seen this many times, you won't want to address questions on it. You won't feel like sharing it about it as much. That's the number one reason that parents aren't talking to their kids about money. It's because they don't have that confidence in it themselves. Now I want you to have the confidence, but also if you don't know something, don't worry about it. As mentioned before, make learning and expanding your knowledge of personal financial topics a daily ritual. You should stay aware of the latest studies, economic news, and spend as much time learning more about the particular subject matter that you teach. Strive to be an expert, and in this endeavor, consistent education is key. Even with a vigilant learning goal, there still may be questions that you don't know the answer to. If that comes up, say, that's a great question. I'm going to actually have to look up the answer and I'll get back to you on it. I'll email you on it. Praise them for asking a good question and let them know that they don't need to know everything. They just need to know where to find the answers. Today, the great thing is with the internet and having advisors is you can make a phone call. You can look up something online and just get the answer. You don't have to know everything. I encourage you to continue to strive to learn as much as possible, but you don't have to learn everything. Now we've talked about this many times. The presenter should try and learn as much about the participants as possible before the event and spend the first few moments of the event understanding what the participants want. The more prepared you are for the audience, the better it is. You're going to notice in our curriculum, almost every classroom session starts with an activity that is based on dreams, goals, and lifestyle. We want to connect money and what they want to achieve in life, what they see on TV, and help them understand their goals and their direction. For those of you educators, so to be able to keep the time to be given, 
We talked about this in the measurement section, so let this serve as a reminder. Setting clear goals as the instructor is critical. If you were leading an expedition without a map, do you think you could be very successful? Well, think of yourself as the captain of the class. It's up to you to guide the participants down the right path. Your clear goals are a critical component to ensure that you and they stay on the right course. I want you guys to set up very clear goals for yourself. This is very, very important, not only for the individual classes you're teaching, but long-term goals for how many people you want to reach, the number of times you want to teach a year. All these different things are vitally important. I want you to set very, very clear and concise goals. To illustrate the importance of knowing your audience, I'm going to share with you a story of a young man who worked with us many times. Now, this guy was real talented, 17 years old, and he went out to talk to students at a high school. Now, typically, he went to private schools or schools where the students were well-behaved, and, and they listened and they were engaged. But one time, he got a speaking opportunity outside of the norm, and he did not take the time to understand his audience before he went. And he started his presentation and immediately started being heckled. They were making jokes, wisecracks, uh, you know, talking back and just giving him a hard time. He didn't realize his audience was high school students that recently got kicked out of a normal high school. They were in a supervised environment. Now, had he have went back and, and knew his audience before, he wouldn't have had to pay that price. Uh, he made a mistake. The audience failed. He failed. It was a bad case all the way around. Now, that is an extreme case, but it's really important that you understand who you're talking to. Gain as much information as you can prior to going out because the more prepared you are mentally and with your presentation, the better and smoother it will go. The foundation for rapport is everything we talked about in the preparation phase. When building rapport, you are trying to build trust and connect with your participants in a meaningful way. So how do you start the rapport building process and connect with your audience? Our experts have a few thoughts. Active listening is key. So many times you ask somebody a question and they respond incorrectly. Have you ever asked someone, what's been going on with you? And they respond, good. Often we get caught up in the day to day and don't really listen. It's just one of those things, especially when you're busy. Active listening is critical when you're in front of a class. You want to make sure you're understanding and digging, digging and digging deeper. If somebody says to you, I want to buy a car. Okay. Why do you want to buy a car? Or you can even start with what type of car do you want to buy? I want to buy this type of car. Why do you want to buy that car? Just because I thought it looked cool. What will that do for you? You said it will look cool. What will that do for you? I think it will make me feel good knowing I have a reliable car. Maybe they say, I want to look good when I pull up to school. Why would that be important to you? What's behind that? I like that feeling that it gives me when I'm being noticed and things like that. Or if they're talking about a reliable car, I always worried about my car before. Maybe it might be when I was a single mom, I was worried about my car. I just don't want to have those worries again. Digging deeper. With every question we're asking, especially with money, it makes it easy because there's always a reason behind what they're telling us. If it's a new car, buying a home, getting out of debt, we want to go beyond the initial thing they're telling us and get into those deeper levels. We're going to be talking about that a lot deeper at a later level. We just want you to understand there's psychographics. I mean, basically there's attitudes, values, lifestyle. You know, what is it that makes them them? What is it that makes them understand who they are mentally? We are always trying to drive questions that will help people understand their true goals and motivators. 
A lot of rapport comes down to sharing personal stories, whether positive or negative, and letting them know you're a real person. I'm going to go back to my high school years once again and share with you a story of a great teacher who still impacts me to this day, Mr. Rabbit. Now, this guy, I remember him like it was yesterday because when he came into the class, he was different. He shared stories that were real. He shared some embarrassing things that happened to him. Sometimes he made mistakes. Sometimes he did things that he wasn't necessarily proud of, but he shared it with us so we can learn and gain a deeper understanding on how to be a better person. Now, he influenced the entire class and the class loved him because he opened up and he was vulnerable with us. Get to know your audience's psychographics. The surveys and other tools we shared already will be helpful. Another great tool is to pay attention to the marking designed to target the audience you are teaching. If you're working with adults that are deep in debt, watch the commercials of payday lenders and others who are targeting and marketing to this audience. The messaging they use can be leveraged to help you in the classroom. Also, check out all the media used by your audience, the magazines, websites, and other outlets. All can give us great clues on how to hook our audience.
Okay, so it's important to be real, especially when you're dealing with teenagers. It doesn't matter what age you are, you have to be yourself. They don't expect you to be them. So it's not important that you use any special vocabulary. The most important thing is that you know your subject and you're willing to deliver it to them and enjoy what you're doing. You as a financial educator are in a unique position to make a true difference in somebody's life. Just one piece of information, one piece of advice can truly be that spark that takes a whole nother path and opens up opportunities for them. And whenever I say that, I'm always reminded back of my Cub Scout days. Now back then, my mom was the troop leader. And from what she tells me this day, I guess each year they had a draft, kind of like an NFL draft, to pick the new Cub Scouts for their troops. And there was one gentleman, a kid, up for this draft, and none of the other troop leaders wanted him, which was kind of rude. But my mom, being a loving, welcoming person, welcomed him to, and wanted him to join our troop. So he did. And we all greeted him with open arms as well. Now, the entire year went by and, and, you know, he was having problems at home. Parents going through divorce. He was getting picked on by people at school. He just had a lot of issues. So he wasn't actively engaged, but he did make every meeting and he's a part of the troop. He just wasn't that person leading and making a, a, the, the first moves to participate in activities. Now, the end of the year happened and this was a big finale. When we got to camp out, start a fire, barbecue, and do those things that Cub Scouts do. You know, we were tying knots and, and having fun. Now, the, the actual finale was when we got to start a fire, fire with a flint. And this flint started to make its way around the troop. You know, we built up this uh, pile of wood and we're getting ready to start it. And each of us Cub Scouts tried it, but we had no success. It finally gets to be Chris's turn. And again, with some encouragement from my mom, he participated at first, kind of just stroking it like soft. It wasn't really showing that effort, but he accidentally got a big spark and immediately then his whole persona changed. He started uh, trying to spark this with more vigor. And finally, we see a few big uh, sparks shoot off and all of a sudden some smoke comes up and this fire starts. Everybody was amazed. We all tackle him. We're just laughing, having a good time. I've never seen this kid so happy in my life. Now, fast forward many years later, my mom's at the supermarket. She sees this gentleman with a leather jacket, spike hair, mohawk, piercings. It's a guy you would not want to run into in a back alley, but she recognizes him and he walks up to her, Mrs. Shorb, Mrs. Shorb, how are you? And the very next thing he said was, remember back when I was in Cub Scouts and I was the only one able to start that fire. Now, that make it, made a tremendous difference in his life. Just that one thing he held on to. So you, as a financial educator, have that ability to make a huge difference in somebody's life because this information is needed. People need this every day. So realize that as you're going out there and sharing this with your community, you are making a lasting difference in the lives of those you touch. That little spark, that little piece of information you give somebody 
can make a difference. I remember we do a lot of work for veterans. And this one young lady, she came up to me and she was so worried about one small issue, one small thing that was weighing her down. In fact, the first half of class, she was disengaged. She just wasn't there and you can see it. And I met with her at lunchtime and we started this conversation. And what we found was this issue was so small. And we worked about 10 minutes together, went through, created a plan. I covered what was gonna be talked about in the second half of the course, and immediately you see this weight lift off her shoulders. She sparks up the entire next half of the course. Her eyes were bright. She engaged, she was there. And I share this story because you as an educator, if you just can help people get past one issue, sometimes you can see an immediate difference in their lives. They can get that instant gratification. Other time, it's that longer term gratification where you're helping them gain skills that will help them in future years. And hopefully you'll get some emails or phone calls thanking you for that in the future. So to recap, the educational sales phases we talked about already. Phase one, preparation, be ready, be prepared. Phase two, listening and rapport. When you're in the class, even before the classroom, understanding the audience through surveys, when in the classroom, build that rapport. You're listening intently, active listening, digging down, digging down deeper into those questions. Phase three, offer solutions in a benefit-driven manner. A key part of any sales process comes after you understand the client's goals and build rapport. This is when you offer a solution that will help them accomplish those goals. Within the financial literacy course, the solutions we present are for them to continue their education and take the action steps that will help them meet their personal objectives. Solutions can only be offered once your participants have a sense that you understand where they're at now and their future goals. We'll talk a lot more about this in the take action phase of this framework. We want to educate with benefits, not features. This is taken straight out of marketing. You don't hear a company marketing juice say, this juice has 6.2 grams of grape juice. They always add on the benefit the end user will experience. For instance, this juice has 100% of daily vitamins so you will feel energized throughout the day. They conveniently add visuals that reinforce the big difference drinking their juice can make in your life. You'll see the targeted demographics doing something fun and highlights the energy and vitality they'll feel because of the juice. In your presentations, be sure to have included benefits in all of the features you share. The example I have here today. Today, we're going to learn about credit. Well, it's a feature. Today, we're going to show you how to improve your credit score by 20 points. That's a feature. What does that mean to somebody? Okay, I want to improve my credit score by 20 points, but what's the benefit attached to it? Well, basically, how much they could save. For example, if they buy a $30,000 car, the difference between good and bad credit can mean as much as $10,000. If they're buying a home, it can mean as much as $100,000 plus. Always attach that benefit. What I would say after telling them that this could save as much as $10,000 off after your car purchase, okay class, what would you like to do with that $10,000 you saved? Then we're taking that money and relating it to a lifestyle goal. What would you like to do? This is again where you're learning about the class. Anytime we talk money, anytime we mention dollar figures, like when I mentioned a million dollars before or how that's saving $10,000 doing this, doing that. First thing, the numbers catch them, but then we really want to drill down and get them to connect with how they're going to be able to live their life. What benefits can they personally experience? Let's talk about saving money at a young age or saving money to purchase a home. How will it feel when you have that home? Digging down into the real benefits. Focus your presentation to include the specific benefits that will impact their lives. When you give them a specific benefit that They've already told you, for example, I want to travel. I would dig down from that question and say, where do you want to travel to? I want to go to Rio. When you're saving those benefits, hey, $10,000, you can easily afford your trip to Rio. The exchange rate is two to one. You're going to be living large down there or whatever the case may be. A simple technique is to share with them the lessons, then ask, how will this benefit you? Instead of telling them 
let them tell you. Guide them along the way, but let their mind think how that topic or lesson can benefit them personally. Drive down to those specific benefits someone can relate to. I want to take that a step further. Dive down to the specific lifestyle benefits that they can experience. When I say lifestyle benefits, I'm not just saying lifestyle benefits right now at this moment in time. What I'm talking about is lifestyle benefits that can continue to last. Maybe get into how they will feel. For example, how will you feel 10 years from now when you know you will have money in the bank? You'll feel financially secure. You're well financially. Well, how will you feel? How will your life be different? I'll now be able to sleep at night, not worry. I'll be able to know that my kids can go to college, whatever that case may be. Think about the benefits that you experience as you are achieving financial wellness or have goals to achieve financial wellness, wherever you're at personally. If you've already achieved financial wellness, think about the benefits you're receiving. Share that. If you're into a work in progress, think about those steps that you're experiencing. The lighter load eventually, Maybe you're going through financial problems now. That's okay. You can share that with the audience and share with them the hope and desire for future benefits as well. Again, benefit-driven statements are key. We're going to be talking a lot about that quite a bit through everything we do from this point on. So we need to let them know this is not your average high school class, which they've already spent 10,000 hours listening to other subjects. And with money, it's very important that they understand that this is a different type of class. Up until now, we've engaged them through this conversation. We've built rapport and asked good questions that help us determine their goals. We've motivated them throughout the process. We've educated them with very solid education. Now what's left? Do something. Take that action. And if you've done the first three steps right, this part is easy. Think back to the last time you sold something that you really wanted. The salesperson took that time. They really consulted with you and understood your needs. Maybe you came in for something else that was a higher price and they said, you know what, that's not going to work for you. Start here. I think this will suit your needs. You're building that relationship. Then it comes time to take action and you're wanting that action step. Okay, great. I'm happy to sign this contract or happy to do this. This action piece is critical. If you do the first three steps right, they're going to want this next piece. In sales, refer to this as closing the client. Closing is what separates the average salespeople from top salespeople. Alex Baldwin has a famous line in one of the best sales movies, Glen Gary, Glen Ross. He said, coffee's for closers. This line is used in sales offices around the world and shows the esteem that closers get. In the education world, your job is to close them on taking action. Education is great, but with financial literacy, our goal is to get them to create positive financial habits that lead them toward their financial goals. We'll share with you some tips that will help you, but it's up to you to practice this skill set every time you're teaching a class. Your call to action will depend on the class you're teaching. What is the subject matter and goals you have established for the class? Your goals will guide the action steps you'll be promoting. For instance, if you're teaching a class on retirement planning, give them clear, concise steps that will help them take the necessary steps to plan for the future. One of the things you should always encourage with every class is to continue their education. Get the class to devote a set amount of time per week. We suggest at least an hour a week spent on learning more, growing and educating themselves. The more you can promote ongoing education, the better. Times are changing quickly. Technology is changing even quicker. Anything you can do to continue to learn and grow will benefit you. So get in the habit of a lifelong learner. 
The great thing is that today, education just doesn't mean reading a book or attending a class. People can learn through talking to experts, wa watching an educational documentary, completing activities, surfing the net for information. There are many educational options available and encourage your audience to find the method that best suits their learning styles. Timing is critical when closing your audience. It's important to time the call to action at a time when there's high energy or high emotion. Anytime you recognize that in a class, it's important you can address those solutions or get them to take the next steps. I mean, get them to do whatever you want them to do. Anytime they're emotionally charged, it's a good time to propose that solution. Spend an evening watching direct response infomercials that are selling get rich quick type products. I mean, they understand how to leverage your emotional climax to get you to take action. And that's what, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to leverage when we propose a solution. A good time to propose solution is during our discussion on dreams, lifestyle, family goals, or other emotionally charged topics. When you practice your presentation, look for those areas and get in the habit of inserting solutions at the high energy times. Also play close attention to your audience. When they have their interests, close them on the solution. Up through now, we've been talking about really high-end consultative sales approach in the education field. Now, I'm going to integrate some old school type sales techniques as well. For those of you salespeople out there listening, this is more of that Tommy Hopkins style stuff, but it works really well in the education field. One effective closing technique we can use is called assuming the close. We're going to assume whatever action we want the participants to take. For instance, we can ask, do you want to learn about money? Now, if we ask a question like that, it's not assuming anything because their brain's thinking, yes, uh, I think I want to learn about money or no, I, I don't want to learn about money or, or maybe. We're not leading them down the path. Now, there's a very different thought process that goes through their head, but assuming the close will lead them into the action we want them to take. Choice closing is another great way to inspire your participants to take action. We can 
given a, a, a culture that really highlights the consequences and benefits of them taking specific action. For instance, let's say we're talking about credit. And we can ask the question like, hey, would you rather worry about getting turned down for a car loan and, and feeling an embarrassment of having a sales person looking over you and knowing you didn't qualify? Or would you rather feel confident when you walk into it with your credit, knowing that your credit's good and you feel secure and you're excited to have them pull your credit and discover that you have qualified for the lower credit? Well, it's kind of a long way to trust you, but it basically illustrates sort of the consequences and the potential rewards of having good credit. So a good alternative choice would give that very polarized uh, uh, suggestion to the next question. Uh, you can do it in your own life. Let's say um, your significant other, uh, 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 you know, you want to go out and eat with your significant other. And let's say you want to try a, a new Italian restaurant to open up around the corner. And your significant other, you know, does not like Chinese food. You can always ask this question. Hey, would you rather have Chinese food or go to the new Italian place? What are they going to say? They're probably going to answer the new Italian place because they don't want to go to that Chinese place because they don't like that food. So we can utilize that in many different ways and we can use this throughout the class and, and many different types of examples that we're teaching. So let's switch this over to the personal finance level. We can say something like, your choices are clear. You can either rebuild your credit and have lower monthly payments and feel that confidence in your credit and be able to qualify, or you cannot rebuild your credit and pay more each month, always be worried about the interest rate suggestions and other problems that can happen with that. Again, there's two choices. Most people will lean toward that positive choice and this alternative choice when they feel empowered to make that decision, it's basically their mind telling them, hey, this is the route we're going to go. Another powerful closing technique we can use in the classroom is simply asking for their commitment. Now, the real critical aspect of this commitment asking close is that we built rapport. We built that trust with our participants, and we've done those first phases properly. So once we do this, we can ask questions that simply ask for their commitment. We can ask something like, now that you understand this concept, how many people are going to take whatever action you want them to take? Raise your hand. It's always important that in this commitment piece, you ask them to raise their hand, vocalize, be engaged in that question. Or we may say something like, uh, uh, whatever, we'll describe an action step that they can take. Whether it be write out your goals, do your budget, or you can say, hey, how many people will do your budget for you? Raise your hand. You can do that, say, how many people will do it for yourself? You understand how important this is in your life. How many people will do it for yourself as well? Raise your hand. Get your commitment. We can ask it in a deeper way. How many people value your life so much to take 10 minutes off your class and write the top three financial goals? Raise your hand. Again, each question you ask, we ask them to take some form of action. That's helping to connect their physicality with their brain and it gets them more engaged in the next conversation. It has a mental effect on people. So when you get them saying yes, it's gaining commitment. It takes them through that learning process and it becomes more real for them as well. So consistently get the habit of consistently asking for commitment throughout your presentation. The future person is always an effective close when we're teaching personal finance as well. Now, it's important with this one, you need to be very careful because a lot of times, depending on the audience, the future skills for person, especially for those facing many layers of financial challenge. I'm going to share with you a few examples you can use with your participants. For example, we could say something like, by now you know you're going to be taking steps to improve your financial situation. How will your life improve when you succeed in those areas? 
again, we're presupposing that they're going to take these action steps and say, hey, how will your life be different? Again, their brain automatically switches to, okay, hey, I'm, I'm taking these steps. How will this improve my life? It's a great way to introduce them to the future person. Another way is just to get them to picture their future. We can contrast the positive and negative version of their future. Or if you just say, hey, picture yourself in five years after you take a new step. How will your life be different? How will you feel then? Get them to share that with you again. We're presupposing they've taken these steps and there's no changes that will benefit their future. You can also contrast this with the alternative version of their future. And say something like, let's say you don't take these steps now. What will your future look like? Again, you can see the very grim reality of their future there. And you can really contrast it with that positive reality in the question 54. So, what we're doing here is just like a map. If you have something in your sight, and you see that the direction we can go that will lead us to less pain and more enjoyment and basic human quality, we can direct people to the questions we ask, the things we have in the vision. What we're essentially doing is giving people that clear vision, that in goal, something that they can focus on. We want them to be able to say, hey, I see how it's going to improve my life. I see the benefit. That's how I want to live. And I know the steps now that I can take to get there. Another great close you can use that will help people understand the benefits associated with personal finance is called the Ben Franklin Close. This helps people logically evaluate the pros and cons of what action you want them to take. And doing this close is pretty simple. Have them pull out a piece of paper. Draw a T, a big T, on that piece of paper. Now, on the left side of that T, they're going to write reasons for it. And on the top right side, they're going to write reasons against. Now that they have this structure in place, whatever your topic you're introducing for, for them, maybe it's credit or budgeting or whatever, have them write the reasons for on the left side, and you can have them list out all the ways and all the benefits they can have from building good credit or, or establishing a good budget. On the right side, they'll write reasons against. Now, the beauty of teaching personal finance, there's typically a ton more reasons for and very small reasons against. So it's a very positive thing for, to help them evaluate this logically. So after they complete this list, have them agree that the reasons for significantly outweigh the reasons against and encourage them to take action. Now is a great time to follow up with that assumptive close or the commitment to close. All of these closing techniques can help you. It does take practice. So get as much practice as possible before you do live presentations. It's really critical you get in the habit of implementing these closing techniques in all of your presentations. Now, it can actually be really fun and you'll get to see great responses from your audience when you do so. The last phase, phase five is about your personal improvement. This starts by getting feedback from your participants, partners, and others involved in your events. We can then use this feedback to learn how we can be a more effective instructor. In this phase two, we discuss the importance of continuing your personal education so you're continually improving. Let's start with feedback. You know, sometimes getting feedback can be scary. However, getting comments from your participants is essential for your improvement. Each class, you should get a formal and informal feedback. While the class is taking place, ask questions like, how will this subject benefit you? Do you see how this can support your other goal? Ask other questions that gauge the impact of the course. Also keep an eye on their body language. If you see slumping and yawning, get them up and moving. There is always a solution to engage their participants and in the next class, we're gonna give you an arsenal of tools that you can use. Besides conducting informal surveys in class, always conduct a post-event survey. Have participants complete a short survey, you know, less than 10 questions. That's basically the typical length of our surveys. Be sure to compile the data and review their comments. What did they like? What didn't they like? And how can you improve? Reading some of the negative comments can sometimes make people defensive. 
However, you know better. You will look at the positive and negative comments and as tips on how you can improve. Please understand that some of the negative comments can come from people with deep psychological barriers surrounding money. If you're not getting the feedback you want right away, take a moment. Some people get divorced over money issues. Some people are just so stressed out that they're worried that they're not sleeping at night when they come to you or come to your class. So understand that. You may need to take a breath and remember that through empathy, through understanding, you go to become a great educator. Our role as an educator is to get people past whatever barriers they're experiencing. It is also important to ask your partners, sponsors, and others involved what are their thoughts. We always provide a clear checklist of responsibilities prior to the event. Then we meet with our partners after and walk them through the checklist so they are certain we meet and exceeded the expectations set. We also have a checklist for our partners and we want to make sure that they're living up to their agreement as well. How to deal with objections are important. Those working with kids and teens typically do not get strong objections. In fact, most want to learn about money. Oftentimes, their objections are just about education in general and not with what you're teaching. Some do have preconceived notions from what they hear from their parents or what they read. But for those working with adults, objections occur more often and they have a much deeper emotional connection with the subject of money. As you learn, many adults have made mistakes. They don't want to face reality and they don't want to change. A great way to deal with this is through the feel, felt, found method. They may come up and say, I need to have my coffee in the morning. It's an important part of my day. I need it. I know I'm not saving money. I know it can save me a few hundred dollars, but I want that. I'm not going to take your advice there. How can you answer that instead of going, that's dumb. It doesn't align with your longer term goals. Instead of that, we're going to use framework. I understand how you feel. I felt that way before, the same way. I felt that making this change personally helped me enjoy life more. What I want to talk about right now before I get into this is, when you're using this method, it has to be real. Don't make stuff up. Either share real stories that you experienced or share stories that you read about or maybe you've heard from others. I understand how you feel. I've experienced that before. I love coffee or I had a friend that loved coffee that said the same thing or I had a client that felt the same way as you do. For example, I understand how you feel. I had a very close friend that felt the same way about her coffee in the morning. Her goal was she wanted to save up for a car and she, was, she wasn't saving any money at the time. But what she found out was that by just giving up that coffee and making it at home, she was much happier when she was able to buy that car six months, a year later, whatever the case may be. Looking back, she found that having a car was a lot more important than giving up her coffee and she said she would do that again in a heartbeat. Relating with them, giving them some validity, you're understanding their feelings. I understand how you feel and I felt that way or maybe someone else that you read about or somebody in your life. I felt that way before, personally too. Give them that connection than what you found by making those positive changes in your life. What have I found? What did she find that made her much happier? You know, I was much happier by being able to accomplish whatever that goal might be. I was much happier being able to buy my home or knowing that I had a few months of money in my bank. Maybe I didn't have to worry about losing my job. Try to integrate these things that I said before into this. It's a much better way to handle objections. You're going to enlist people instead of building up a bigger wall. It is highly suggested that you go through the Certified Financial Education Instructor course twice. The second time you go through the course should be after you completed five or ten events. We cover a lot of information in this course and you will find it helpful to revisit the lessons after you try to implement what you learn in a presentation setting. We also invite you to continue your education in other ways. A few books that we recommend are Teaching What Matters Most, Developing Minds, The Connected Educator, and The Unschooled Mind. There are a lot of books on this subject matter, so find the one that resonates with you. The Psychology of Selling talks a lot about active listening, asking the right questions. Where it says selling, you can just put education. 
The Psychology of Education is also a highly recommended book because a lot of those same techniques we discuss in the educational sales approach are covered in Brian Tracy's book. There are some great movies as well that can inspire you to improve as an instructor and you'll pick up some good teaching tips by watching it closely. Check out Stand and Deliver, Dangerous Minds, Dead Poets Society, Half Nelson. These are all great teacher movies that can motivate you to take your skills to the next level. Read magazines, newspapers, and anything that will help you improve your teaching effectiveness. Be a sponge that soaks up knowledge. I want to now recap the educational sales lessons and give you a clear framework of the sales education process. First, establish clear, concise goals for you personally. What do you want to accomplish? What is it that you want the end user to do? What is that action piece that you want them to take? Know that before you go in. Build rapport in a conversational tone. We're not going around the class interviewing people, we're, bu we're building rapport. I like to share stories first before I ask it of somebody. You know, for those of you who are dating or anything like that, what does it feel like when somebody continues to barrage you with questions? Ask, ask, ask. They're asking deep stuff that you may not want to share. But if you're sharing things and then asking, it's much easier. It opens up that conversation more. So balance out your questioning by sharing. Be vulnerable. Get out there. Let them know about your experience and how you can relate to them in a way that's authentic to you. When can you ask probing questions? Once you build up that rapport, you can start asking probing questions. Dive in deeper and deeper until what's really at the core, which is their value and belief system. So, I want a car. Why? What will that car do for you? Getting down, how will you feel? What's important? Yo, I want my friends to be able to go on this. I want to be able to pull up in front of the club and look good. I want. Whatever the case may be, why would that make you feel good? Get down at the deepest level you can possibly can, but also realize you can only dig as deep as you shared. It's a really important point. You can only dig as deep as you've shared. If you're asking people to share real personal stuff and you haven't shared anything, it's not going to work. In addition, we need to be a little careful there. If you know somebody getting very uncomfortable through their body language or anything, don't pressure them because it's a classroom situation. Dig as deep as comfortable. If you start to hit a little tougher clay or tougher dirt down there, when you're digging, don't dig any deeper. Back off because not only will that person appreciate it, but the entire class will also. If you're also probing somebody too hard and you think, I need to get down deeper, I need to dig down to their values and beliefs, I need to know this, Vince said it on this one thing, no, we need to get down as far as they will let us without pushing too hard because if the rest of the class sees that, they may not want to share. Because you're trying to dig deeper on one person, the rest of the class may not want to share different things. They're going to be like, oh, he's going to dig too deep with me too. Make sure you respect your audience. You respect the boundaries, but push a little. You can only dig as deep as you shared, but if there's any pushback, body language, the way they're answering questions, you'll be able to notice it. We'll talk about that later. Make sure you slow down. Stop the questions and say, thank you very much for sharing. Anybody else want to share? Or move on with your next lesson. Important point there. Offer solutions. Let's focus on benefits, lifestyle benefits. How will that directly impact the things that they like to do? And how do we integrate that into the longer term plan for themselves? Then we want to take a close look and ask for a commitment to take action. Give them those different closes. Practice those alternative choices, assumptive clothes, those different things. They're old school style sales techniques, but they work great in a classroom setting. With that, let's get into neuro linguistic program. As mentioned before, there's empirical data out there that shows some of the claims no linguistic practitioners have not been able to prove by studies. Many of these practitioners have too good to be true benefits that you know, basically cast a shadow on the entire subject matter. What we're gonna do is share with you a few things that we've found beneficial with NLP and where the research was present. Basic idea of NLP, which you can all agree upon, is that people by nature move away from pain and toward pleasure. 
One of the big functions of our role as financial educators is to get people to move beyond the short-term pleasures and to help build them to see the bigger picture goals which may give them more pleasure in the long run. Another premise of NLP is that we use often in class are to use language patterns that we can use to influence people's behavior. There's a connection between our mind and language, the neural side and the linguistic side, which is the voice or language patterns we utilize. Remember in the educational sales approach, we just covered how to ask questions in a way that are aligned with NLP language patterns. Let's take a look at the NLP pyramid. We've been talking about this throughout the course. A big part of moving people to take action is understanding their values and their beliefs. What's motivating them to make a change? This chart will provide you a framework to measure what level you understand your participants. One of the first things you want to do is identify. Who are you as a person? This may be a little too deep for the class. In fact, it sometimes takes a lifetime for people to understand who they truly are. But we can get to understand their values and their beliefs with good questioning. The second part is values and beliefs. What's important to you? What inspires you from the core of your being? What is it that makes you you? I know many of you for the values and beliefs you believe in improving the lives of people, making them more financially capable. That's why you're here. And understanding their values and beliefs will help us present the material in a better way. Environment. What has made you you? The examples I've been using have been about you personally, but I want you to start thinking about your end user. As you're asking the questions, it would be great to be able to know the identity of those that you're teaching. It's a little hard to get to, and a lot of people truly don't know or even understand their identity. I know, at least for myself, I have a pretty good direction, but I'm still working on a lot of details. I definitely know my values, and I believe most people have a good idea on this, even our younger kids. If they're starting to develop their values and belief system at an earlier age, this is going to be an easier process for them. I hope you found this framework helpful. Please think through your own identity, values, and beliefs. What capabilities do you bring to the table and what behaviors will make you an effective educator? Then think back to what made you you. The questions we ask, we want to drill down to understand their values and beliefs. That's why I included this NLP portion in here. Not for the science itself, but how it relates to how we can connect with their values and beliefs and things they want in life. Right now, I want you to follow along on how to create your own educational sales action plan. Go through the action steps that I mentioned here. Spend at least 20 minutes on it right now or at the end of class. I know many of you are working, I know many of you have taken time out of your day, and I know many of you understand the benefits of actually incorporating this into your education, but 
Take time now to complete this activity and it will help cement what you've learned in this training session. Just talking with you, you've told me you want to help people avoid problems they faced before. You want to be recognized as a leading educator. You want to pursue this as a passion for yourself. You want to build your business. These are the things that you've told me. What do you need to do in order to achieve that? What is that little step that can help you get you there? The sales process is critical to bringing into the classroom. You understand that now. You understand that by knowing how to deliver this in a fashion that's very relevant and connects with the audience, you'll be able to make those bigger changes for them. And you're going to be doing a much better job as an educator because of it. I encourage you all to take these steps. I look forward to our next class session together.